information session on the uh, student research fellowship uh, of the India China Institute. Indeed, fellowship uh, are signatory programs at India China Institute since its inception um, in 2004. Right now, a international fellowship program on shifting geography uh, in expertise and policymaking is ongoing and fellows, um, our fellows meet bi-weekly reading about and exchanging opinions on how expertise play roles in policymaking and how it affects decision making. The Institute also uh, closed out its faculty fellowship, faculty and PhD student fellowship on studies surrounding the pandemic discourse last year. Um, over the years, the Institute had sponsored this student fellowship has sponsored close to 100 students in 14 cohorts, nurturing the interests of our students' community in the pursuit, in their pursuit, in the global affairs. Uh, the seed money, we feel, um, which is, I think this year we're setting it out for $2,500 to $3,500 if travel is, um, is, is, is possible. Uh, the seed money really enables some of our students to set foot often, often for the first time in India or China or both countries. Um, for others, the fellowship allows them to further studies in topics that they have worked on for many years. Young Alan is over there, who was a student fellow uh, at India China Institute, uh, did exactly the the. the it, exactly that. So the seed money um, encourages expansion of their, the vision and their work. Um, we are very excited that the uh, uh, student fellowship is resuming this year uh, due to the uh, COVID-19, um, the program was suspended last year. The inspiration is largely on the existence of building an international community with the international vision at the new school, partly also encouraged by the student fellows, the last cohort of student fellows whose work, um, this cohort was 2019 uh, to 2020 uh, due to the COVID-19, their travel award due to the uh, COVID-19 and the hurdle of international travel. Some of the students were not able to go. Some managed to be in the country. Um, others who were not able to go uh, was able to uh, conduct research online. So we are inspired by um, the effort uh, by the uh, research, um, uh, yeah, the research effort. Um, I think that's why we are here today. We're going to hear their stories in a minute um, of they are um, working on the chosen topics in the last two years. Um, Mark Fraser is uh, co-director of India China Institute. Uh, Mark Fraser will uh, talk about uh, the fellowship um, for a few minutes. Uh, Mark is yours. Okay, thank you, Grace. Uh, welcome to everyone, to the fellows from the 2019-2020 cohort and to those of you in the room who are here uh, as part of our information session. As you know, and as you've seen from the announcements, um, we have a new round for uh, the coming year for uh, possibly, uh, we hope, uh, international travel and research in uh, the summer of 22. Uh, we have an application deadline of February 1st, uh, 22, uh, at which we will, uh, soon after which we will we will make decisions and, and award uh, fellowships. Um, and, and there's plenty of information on the website about the, the kinds of application materials. And at the conclusion of uh, the fellows, uh, individual presentations today, we will have time, uh, 20 minutes or so for question and answer from, from anyone, uh, and especially those of you who are joining us and, and are here to learn more about the, the fellowship program. Um, I wanna say a word of, of really uh, deep thanks and, and express my great admiration for the persistence and, and patience and real um, dedication that, that the, the six presenters today have shown in overcoming uh, the challenges that all of us have faced individually and in families and households and, in, and whatever other dimensions, universities and research centers over the last two years. But the, 
the the research that you're about to hear, uh, you know, reflects that dedication and patience and persistence uh, of each of the fellows who had to uh, quickly adjust to to realities uh, that we all have have had to to face uh, over the last eighteen months to two years. Um, I also want to say, uh, and this is based on my observations, not just of this cohort, but of several other cohorts uh, in the 10 years I've been um, involved in this program um, in the STAR Foundation uh, Student Travel Fellowship Awards, uh, is that uh, these are amazing catalysts uh, to uh, the intellectual direction that an undergraduate would take in terms of the types of, of work they might do as a major and indeed as a, a senior capstone project. I've also seen it uh, transform the uh, intellectual direction of, uh, of a graduate student, whether they're an MA, uh, getting an MA degree and working on a thesis, or uh, in, in quite a few cases I've seen of PhD students who are not sure of their topic for their dissertation, but through this uh, summer research award, uh, they are able to go for a couple, three or four weeks, depending on the, the costs and the logistics, but come back with a very clear idea of, of what their uh, dissertation topic will be and a, and a clear uh, you know, kind of set of directions. That's because they've made contacts, they've gotten an interest, they've seen what's possible. And so uh, I think that that's a really important part of, of this award as well. And finally, one other thing, just before I turn it over uh, to, to the, the, this year's uh, cohort for their presentations, is that um, you know when we say research in India and China, um, you know this is in the, for this is for those of you who are considering. We get questions about well, it does does Taiwan count? We'll hear a presentation indeed today from someone uh, who did work in Taiwan. We've had presentations. We've had past fellows who've, who've done work primarily in Hong Kong. So when we say uh, you know China India, we're we're broadly defining these topics. If you wanted to study, um, as we're about to hear today, indie music by a you know a, a diasporic uh, um, group performing in Indonesia you know that that would be considered um, as as a possible uh, uh, topic. We're not we're not just sponsoring research within the actual uh, you know territorial boundaries of of uh, the Republic of India and the People's Republic of China. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our presenters, and I believe uh, first we have Jerome Allen. Uh, I'll ask uh, each. Uh, presenter to quickly introduce their uh, their background, their degree, and, and then go on with their project. project. So uh, please, Jerome, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mark. All right, I will share the screen. Actually, I'm gonna keep it in this screen just because I have some video content and it's easier for me to toggle, but um, my name is Jerome Allen and I, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm studying acting at the, at the School of Drama at the new school, and I'm a third year, so I'll be graduating this year, which is great. <laughs> um, and my project is on engaging with the practices of political theater in India. Um, so just a little bit about myself. So prior to the new school, um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine, where I studied uh, secondary English. Um, I also worked with theater in Ukraine by starting a, a camp um, for students. And after that, I was in DC teaching, and then I joined the New School community. Um, so a bridge a version of my life in the last 10 years. Um, so what inspired my like want to uh, apply to the program as well as um, go to India was I visit Varanasi um, in 2018. And I have a little video right here. Hopefully it'll play. Um, so I took this um, when I was there, and I was really inspired just by like how many people would show up in the streets um, of Varanasi specifically to see live theater. Um, so I found myself like engaging with that, and then I started talking to people about like so why um, just about actually politics because that's one of my interest and a lot of people would speak about the Modi administration or Islamophobia specifically in um, Varanasi and um, just sort of had me like had some ideas percolating of like I wonder if there's an intersection between these two so 
Um, I came to this thesis um, when writing the thing as a current grad student in the acting master's in fine arts program at the New School of Possessing and Undying, Undying Enthusiasm Political Theater. I want to foster my continuous work as a theater practitioner by traveling to Bangalore, Karnataka, India to continue to explore the feedback loop between Indian political theater and the socio-political governmental trends. So my research is based off of two theater practitioners specifically, um, Safdar Ashmi and Augusto Boal. Um, Augusto Boal created Theater for the Oppressed, um, which is specifically giving back power and empowerment to the community um, in a theatrical setting and using that as a catalyst to speak about social issues such as um, racism or um, classism and whatnot. And Safdar Ashmi specifically took Boal's writings and teachings into the streets of India and um, would put on plays in the middle of the street at, and he would put on plays at uh, factories and getting people to speak about uh, union work and um, unfortunately was also, I guess you could consider himself a martyr, a martyr because he um, died due to gang violence um, when inciting, when talking about union rights. And this is one picture I always find myself kind of returning back to, because um, specifically in community theater, it starts out with one person um, sort of speaking to the audience and engaging with what the audience wants uh, to talk about. And then you have some improvisers who come up with skits and the people from the audience can join the people on stage to um, improvise as well, to talk about communal issues. Um, so yeah, that was my inspiration. So I had a few community partners that I worked with, uh, Bangalore Little Theater, uh, Ranga Shankara, and Bangalore University. Um, I also had a mentor who was a for former faculty recipient to the travel grant. So she connected me with some other colleagues as well, Jonathan Skriti and Ayan Georgia. So unfortunately, because it's a very physical, like in the moment craft, um, I was not able to make it to um, Thank you. Make it to India um, just because large gatherings were, um, as we know, were halted. So I'm going to go a little bit quicker. Um, so here's like vaccination rates by the time that I was looking at this were not, were pretty low and unfortunately remain low up until recently. So I found myself actually looking into doing digital theater at Bangalore Little Theater um, and with the Center of Community Dialogue. Um, so I kept up with them, did a few readings with them. Um, and um, quite recently, I found that specifically the Center for Community Dialogue and Change and Bangalore Little Theater were, instead of like focusing on political theater in the guise of the community, they were focusing on how do we bring our community as theater practitioners together and make it stronger. Um, so I was a witness to that, which felt pretty great. And as of recently, there's been a transition to back to on in-person theater, but that's only for certain companies, that's not for all companies. So, wow, I was really able to speed through this. Um, so my final thoughts are that I think hybrid Zoom, like Zoom and in-person theater has far reaching potential for global collaboration. I was able to work with some Indian uh, theater practitioners. Um, so I got a little bit of a taste of my project. Um, and I thought that practitioners taking time to reevaluate their place in theater practicing was pretty great. And I hope to do this project in 2022 or 2023 because I feel like the work is not done when um, it's such a physical work. Um, and thank you. Here's a picture of me in Varanasi and my contact information if you would like that. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, yeah, let's move on to Dante. Dante, you wanted to introduce yourself first. Okay, sure. And thanks, Jerome. That was very interesting. Okay. So let me move back a little bit, get my presentation working properly. Okay. Um, yeah, so my name is Dante Scaglione. I'm a recent graduate of um, the liberal arts major, uh, the self-designed liberal arts major at Lang, where I studied, among other things, um, contemporary Chinese culture and Mandarin language. So I was kind of able to parlay those studies into a sort of ongoing interest that I had in um, independent music, or more specifically, the sort of uh, colloquial subgenre indie music uh, in Taiwan, which has taken a sort of a global stage over the past 10 years, has uh, sort of uh, increased its international prominence. And my introduction to that came um, 
in my introduction to Taiwanese music, not only Taiwanese music, but just Taiwan at large, uh, came actually when I was in high school, when I was running an independent record label in Philadelphia and a record and clothing shop in Taiwan called Waiting Room, pictured there on the right, had contacted me and asked, uh, asked to purchase some of our cassettes for their shops. Uh, and in the years that followed, I sort of became tuned in to Taiwanese indie rock and pop music and sort of kept tabs on independent Taiwanese youth culture at large. And through the research I conducted for this project, uh, which culminated in uh, my undergraduate thesis, uh, I, I learned that this was really no coincidence that they'd reached out to me when they did and that they were in the midst of uh, what I've come to dub through this work, um, the, uh, a sort of indie new wave. Um, so I'm unable to cover even really a fraction of the research um, or really do the narrative of the thesis justice in this short presentation, but I can give you a little bit of an overview of what I did during my time in Taiwan. I spent a month there in total. I went sort of right as the pandemic was unfolding um, and the international program that was hosting me uh, decided to send us back out of an abundance of caution. Um, and while I lived there, I... Uh, lived in Taipei, visited sort of a half a dozen record shops, attended a handful of concerts, some of which are pictured here. These are photos that I took. Um, I got a chance to interview concert goers, uh, artists, shop owners. Um, and I, in my time there, I got a chance to travel south as well to Taichung, Tainan, and Kaohsiung. Um, so I won't speak about these at length, but these were a few shops I visited um, that, you know, sort of enjoy a, a prominence uh, in promoting local shows, artists, really sort of cornerstones of uh, the contemporary scene. Um, didn't get a chance to interview the owners of either of these shops. I did get a chance to own, uh, interview the owner here of Kind of Blue, which is a really fantastic um, concept shop in the south of the country in Taichung, um, which focuses specifically on cassette tapes, um, which, was, which was really interesting, really cool. Uh, and then I got to visit Waiting Room, who had reached out to me in 2015. Um, so that was that was a really cool sort of moment of coming together. And that interview yielded um, some really interesting, uh, really interesting information that I was able to tie into my thesis. Um, same goes for this shop here. So in 2021, a year later, um, I remotely interviewed Taiwanese indie music scene veteran Thomas Hu, who's there on the right. Um, as well as the New York-based Mia Min Yen, uh, who's the creator of the annual Taiwanese Waves Music Festival in Central Park, uh, sort of as a way to augment and uh, expand upon the research uh, that I was unable to do, you know, because I didn't spend the full amount of time I'd have liked in Taiwan. And through a combination of all these primary sources, I was able to create a narrative that explored the material conditions, the specific policy developments, and the cultural shifts that took place in Taiwan from the late 80s to the present day, that has given way to this sort of new wave. Now, I've probably already eaten through a lot of time, so I'll, I'll try to go through this quickly. Uh, but essentially, uh, I pictured here are, are two really pivotal records from the 1990s in Taiwan. Um, the late 90s in Taiwan representing um, an important moment in which the state uh, was beginning to fund the production of independent music um, through some very comprehensive uh, sort of public-private partnerships that I learned both through uh, primary source research and external research was really key in um, sort of birthing this, this, this new wave movement, um, you know, empowering a lot of artists, uh, not only to reach domestic audiences, but international ones as well, uh, you know, like myself. So this developmental policy expanded into the 2000s. The number of music festivals increased from four to 20, from 2000 to 2015, and now attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors. And during this time, too, uh, the state began to sponsor through the uh, Ministry of Culture independent artists to travel abroad, uh, fund international performances. Uh, and while just one artist was subsidized in 2009, that jumped from, to 69 in 2011. So again, because I'm out of time, I'll just wrap up here. Uh, over the last 10 years, Taiwanese India has sort of come into its own, utilizing this combination of public funding, new modes of networking, um, and self-directed distribution uh, that have been afforded by new developments in online infrastructure. Uh, so what I've dubbed the new wave can be understood as a large group of successful artists that exist in a sort of separate system, running mostly parallel to the commercial Mando pop industry. These new wave indie artists have achieved widespread notoriety in the wider culture, not only in domestic Taiwan, um, but, it's, but also a sort of unprecedented level of organic integration into uh, international indie scenes. Uh, we, we see saw an uptick in uh, Taiwanese artists touring and collaborating uh, with artists here in the States or in the UK, um, not only 
uh, you know, in festivals like Mia Minyan's Taiwanese Waves, which are specific showcases, but also signing with some prominent um, American indie labels. Um, and final thoughts, uh, the international, or sorry, the independent music scene in Taiwan uh, is sort of only growing from here and showed a really incredible resilience during COVID-19. Uh, Taiwan notably was one of the only uh, places in the world that was sort of able to resume business as usual due to their very comprehensive and effective COVID-19 response. And that extended to uh, their music communities as well. Um, so I hope you found this interesting. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dante. Indeed, um, Taiwan set at the very beginning of the COVID-19, at least was, um, um, you know, did an exemplary work. Um, let's go on to um, Aditi. Aditi actually, Aditi worked in the an office of India China mm -hmm. Institute for some time. Um, a time really flies, Aditi graduated since already from, uh, India, from uh, the new school. Uh, since I'm hearing Gracie talk a, a bit about my work there, uh, I'm also showing you on my website uh, because my camera isn't working. So there's a picture of me, that's how I look. Uh, but I'm an urban planner and strategist. I studied at the new school uh, at the Design and Urban Ecologies program at Parsons. Um, but my work background is also in, it's, it's, it's a mix of community planning, architecture, research, and graphic design. Um, and I'm mainly interested in learning more about housing and how people build agency for themselves in uh, housing struggles. So I have done a, some work in New York uh, with housing cooperatives, uh, some placemaking work in Mumbai, and comprehensive uh, mapping work in Bangalore and Delhi. And a lot of architecture on-site building work as well. Um, so that's a brief background to what piqued my interest in applying for India China Institute grant and uh, specifically studying housing uh, in India and in Mumbai where I am from. Uh, this was my uh, thesis of applying for the grant that 60% of the population in Mumbai live in informalized settlements and are excluded from participating in the process of state housing provisions. The slum rehabilitation scheme, uh, which is a free housing policy uh, in the entire of India, but mostly uh, is visible in Mumbai, uh, elevates this exclusion by making land available for private markets, uh, thereby centering real estate profits. Um, what the Indochina Institute grant allowed me to do is to carry out my ethnographic study in Mumbai, where the field work was designed to interview experts and shadow housing activists uh, with a focus area in case what, and I'll, I'll give a reasoning for that, uh, to deeply understand housing struggles in a specific place-based environment. Um, as I was studying the problem, I was also looking at the mapping legacy in Mumbai, uh, how maps were made and how um, land was reclaimed in Mumbai and how expansion occurred northwards. Uh, I was also studying contemporary mapping techniques uh, and how maps are used as a way to develop uh, agency or not develop agency uh, to exclude people from participating in development processes out of which housing is a major component. Um, one of my, amongst the risk mapping techniques, I was also focusing on understanding where uh, the free housing in Mumbai is being built and where maximum population densities are and how it keeps shifting over time. Um, so I studied housing that was uh, built in 2011 uh, and 2001, according to the meager census data available in, for Mumbai. Um, and you'll see here through the maps how the number of units built by 
the slum rehabilitation authority or the percentage of slums uh, kept moving northwards over time. I also studied, uh, broke down each ward in Mumbai to understand which ward has the highest number of uh, buildings built by the SRA. So Mumbai has around, I think, 18 wards. And I noticed that the K East ward in Mumbai has 171 total number of uh, free housing buildings built by the SRA. And it was an interesting site for me to study because uh, the airport sits in uh, the K East ward. Uh, there are a number of private investments. There is a theme park in case what, so it seemed like an interesting place to kind of understand why uh, the Housing Development Authority was building so many houses uh, specifically in this neighborhood. Uh, I also studied, my literature review took me through studying what were the dominant responses to housing over time. So historically, how was how are nonprofits responding to housing needs? How are government structures responding to housing needs? And you notice that how there's a significant change in response from evictions and clearances from the 1950s uh, to now coming to a place where there is land speculation um, and, and land being given up to private uh, developers to provide housing. Uh, my theoretical framework included uh, understanding concepts of urban informality by Ananya Roy and Caldera, uh, understanding deep democracy, so emergent strategies of self-governance uh, on, on ground, uh, and this concept is introduced by Apadurai and Holstein, and also subaltern studies, how are uh, how, how do we kind of identify demographics of people that are inaccessible to the center of power? Ooh. Is Yang raising hand uh, with a, a, a signifier? Okay. It's five minutes. Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, but what what I, I I should focus on this. The grant really really helped me here, uh, where I was working with housing activists in case what like I explained my focus area, uh, and studying these different types of housing and using my. Uh, theoretical framework in understanding how do you increase agency of people participating in these forms of housing. Uh, so I, I was able to take, uh, this was in March, 2020, that I was in Mumbai and walking with my friend Nitin Kubal. Um, and he, he took me on this journey where he showed me different ho housing provisions uh, how SRA has built different densities of housing in, in a single ward and how some people have been excluded uh, from the processes as well and displaced from the process. Uh, and I was able to speak to them. I was able to hug them pre-COVID almost um, and understand do they have, is there political alignment within um, their own kind of neighborhood? Is there planning literacy, any kind of planning literacy available? Uh, are they self-organized in some way in asking for representation? Um, is there consensus building when they access housing or connection with political institutions? Uh, and are they represented on the map as well? Um, so I, I was trying to understand what's the landscape within a single ward. But it's obviously needed more uh, interviews and more sitting with Nitin uh, later, which COVID did not provide that environment for me. Uh, but this initial study was really helpful in kind of forming my uh, informing my understanding. Um, what I came up with because I was participating, I, I was also this was also a way I was delivering my thesis. Uh, for my graduate program. So I was also trying to understand what, how can a design process be helpful for increasing agency in housing processes. And this is something that I had proposed. Um, it was a bilingual series of uh, mediations through exchange of images and po uh, discourses and policy implications related to slum rehabilitation scheme between housing activists and policymakers 
and experts and agents in need of housing. These are folks I was interviewing that needed to talk to each other. So my, my conclusion was um, that there are silos within uh, this process of grassroots participation and they need to be talking to each other and what is a documented way they can do that. And so my design process uh, proposal was to create a series of workshops, but also assemble the logics uh, formed on ground. And so this is a lot of work to design um, the theory of change, why, what was the need of the workshops, why did people need to talk to each other. And this was some way of assembling the logic of each neighborhood. So this was a, a pamphlet that asks, that, that creates a planning literacy um, that allows you to locate where you are in Mumbai, that allows you to study a bit about the policies that uh, really affect your housing situation. Um, and this is something that I envisioned probably a Nitin Kubbal to kind of feed into. And so I was making um, design components like this, which could be fed into from the grassroots. Yeah, so I'm sorry for wow. taking this time. Wow, there is a lot of work over there, Aditi. Um, thank you. I, 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 I am watching the clock. Um, initially, we have a planner that by 9.35, we are almost done, uh, let's say by this time for uh, of, of, this, of the presentations and opening up the floor for Q&A. So let's be uh, mindful of the time. I do have two uh, PhD students, both from uh, politics department of the New School for Social Research. Uh, that is uh, Ichuan and Nafu, uh, the floor is yours now. Each one will go first and then Nafu. What the hands up at this moment uh, for the participants from the students is really our reminder of the speaker that the last minute is up. So when you see that hand, um, it's pretty much time to uh, wrap up. Thank you very much. So um, each one, um, it's yours. Okay. Okay, so uh, 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 hello everyone, my name is Yichuan Zhou. Uh, I'm now a PhD candidate in politics, politics department at the New School for Social Research. And uh, uh, I'm now working on my, actually I'm not working on my dissertation, but actually supported by the ISAF funding. I'm, I used to pursue a very small project, uh, which used to arouse my attention and interest. Uh, actually, my ICF project focused focus on one kind of uh, third world consciousness that came into being before the arrival of the Cold War. We all know that the, the idea of the third world uh, was frequently used in the 1950s and 1960s. 1960s. However, as I look at the Sino-Indian communication in 1930s, I find some very interesting ideas, uh, actually very similar ideas that used to uh, be, that used to be proposed by uh, Chinese and in Indian intellectuals. And my research project is precisely centered around the inquiry on the formation as well as the legacy of this kind of shared consciousness named Pan-Asianism. So actually my study begins with the investigation of a Chinese intellectual named Tai Yunshan. And this guy is really, really special because after I reviewed the historical documents and contemporary scholarship, I began uh, realizing that it is Tai Yunshan's peripheral status among the Chinese intellectuals that made him the best candidate for establishing the connection with Indian intellectuals. Uh, because uh, uh, in the early 1930s, the KMT, the ruling party of China, uh, became more and more skeptical toward any radicalism, including, including com communism, and began appealing to the traditional values to save the whole country from the crisis. So supported by the KMT, Tan Yunshan, this guy, tried to build co cooperation with intellectuals from India, among which uh, Tiger is it's most well known. And they form an organization named the Sino-Indian Cultural Society in early 19, in 1930s. And uh, actually, uh, at that time in India, intellectuals began develop certain discourse about pan-Asianism. I'm not going to introduce them in details, given the very limited time. Uh, here, I will mainly talk about the first one, 
uh, uh, the spiritual antithesis. Uh, by proposing this kind of discourse, the Indian intellectuals at that time tried to emphasize the, how to say, the particularity of Asian values and traditions, which in their eyes is in the opposition to the Western modernity. And they believe that in according to the Asian values, we value something that, that is really, 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 really different from the Western modernity. And we cherish the spiritual existence instead of obsessing with the material force. And this actually corresponds to the KMT, the ruling party of the, the, the uh, of China. It, I mean, this kind of discourse corresponds to the principle and the prevalences of the KMT at that time. That's the reason why Tan Yunshan could successfully establish co cooperation with, in, with Indian intellectuals. But the problem is, uh, in 1930s, we, we saw the rise of Japan. And uh, some people may ask, what's the difference between the Japanese discourse on Pan-Asianism and the Indian discourse on Pan-Asianism? Because we all know that at that time, the, uh, uh, at, at that time some in, uh, Japanese intellectuals, they also try to emphasize the difference uh, of the Asian values and traditions. So, but we all know what happened because Japan invaded many uh, uh, Asian countries in the 1930s and 1940s. So at that time, th this, is actually, this is actually the very biggest problem faced by many Chinese and, and uh, Indian intellectuals. That is how to explain the difference between their uh, discourse on Pan-Asianism and the Japanese discourse on Pan-Asianism. And uh, so this actually refers to the final question that that I want to share with uh, all of you. And this is also the very biggest question that I'm still thinking uh, about. Maybe in the future, I will develop uh, a journal uh, article uh, based on the, 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 the funding that I, that, that I uh, based on this research supported by the ICI funding. So uh, the, this, is, this is the biggest problem refers to the, the legacy of the final Indian Pan-Asianism. And we all know that in the 1930s, uh, there's a border uh, conflict between India and China. So it seems that this kind of discourse on Pan-Asianism is really uh, fragile. This kind of discourse is actually very, very fragile, particularly when in facing of the, the conflicts between two very powerful and very big nation states. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think the most important uh, problem of the, pan, uh, the discourse on Pan-Asianism is that this kind of discourse lacked a very realistic vision of the of the political issues and the and uh, the the, the uh, and the social issues i mean uh, this kind of discourse cannot provide us with an illuminating views on the develop development issues uh, faced by india and china and especially how uh, what is the connection between the grassroots people uh, with this kind of discourse on pan asianism and actually this uh, really, these are the biggest limitations of the pan-Asianism, and why, and this is the biggest. Re uh, this is the fundamental reason why we see the decline of the discourse on pan-Asianism after the Second World War. Uh, so this is actually the basic uh, information that I want to share with uh, all of you. And I, uh, in the end, I want to talk about something. Uh, about my feeling after I pursued this research, because right now in China, to be honest. Sometimes when we talk about India, the image of India can be very negative. And in China, I mean, because some Chinese intellectuals would say that although China doesn't have democracy, but it seems that China is really successful in promoting industrialization and uh, modernization in comparison with India. So with this kind of uh, uh, conception, when I, uh, when I did the research on the Sino-Indian communication in 1930s, I, I was really astonished by what I found. Uh, uh, about the this this communication between India and China, because uh, as I look at the history of the Sino-Indian communication in 1930s, I find that when facing the rise of Western imperialism, Indian intellectuals and Chinese intellectuals, uh, instead of criticizing each other, they actually they they try to form a one kind of cooperation with each other, and they really show the sympathy for for each other's experience and the crises. So this, this is the reason why I, why I propose the idea that uh, maybe before the arrival of Second World War, we actually saw the rise of, of sort of third world consciousness in India and China. And uh, I think uh, we need to think more about the reason why this kind of discourse uh, declines after 
up to the 1950s and 1930s. And is it is it uh, uh, is this is it uh, possible for us to reactivate this kind of legacy uh, nowadays, especially when we, we are still living in the area of uh, nation state? So uh, as I say, this is just a very small project I used to pursue, and I hope in the future I can develop this project and uh, maybe finish a journal article based on it. So thanks for being my audience. This is all about my essay project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yichuan. And I think this is exactly what the fellowship, uh, you know, initially we were talking about. Uh, well, it um, really helps our people to um, to deeply think about what is happening around us. Um, I, I think for some, the fellowship was designed as an uh, exploratory travel fund initially. Um, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, aside from sponsoring first timers to go to China to explore, it also, um, you know, allows thinkers, uh, our PhD students to further their study. Um, in and expand the research areas. Um, yeah, that's, I, I hope that uh, the audience, some of the students who are here, uh, I saw Tan, uh, Helen Tan raised her head earlier, uh, it raised her hand earlier on. Uh, we'll get back soon to you. Nafu, um, here, here is, um, the floor is yours now. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone and I'm a PhD candidate from politics department and for this project actually this is my dissertation project where I conduct uh, ethnographic fieldwork during the pandemic. I follow a network of shoe factories in the Great Bay area in China. Um, in this research I'm trying to understand the economic restructuring under the concept of flexible production um, but most critically, how is low-end manufacturing transforming its network and strategies in relation to social and political change under the age of smart production AI? And so next slide. And so in 2018, actually, I conduct my preliminary field work and it shows a great percentage of relocation in low-end manufacturing happens in this region, where traditional re recognized as a factory of the world. So from the photo, you can see the empty and quiet production space with, with assembly lines was there waiting for productions to come back for years as well as the shifting markets towards e-commerce is fundamentally changing the way of production or how we can imagine and in practice to, to restructure the way of production. And for the next slides, and this is used to be just one shoe factory, and now it becomes a high-tech park for more than dozens of companies. So, and majority of the companies work for, as a supplier for electronic productions. And the space is become highly mixed used. Such transformation is undergoing for the past decades. I think the benchmark is 2010 after 2008, the economic crisis. So with the support from ICI or also from NSSR, I was able to travel back to the region and working in factories and visiting workshops from the shoe production to understand how low end manufacturing is under the impact of industrial restructuring. So in this photo, I was in a workshop for a chemical reaction process. So in the end of the process, all the metal pieces will have shiny surface with different colors required by the brand. You can imagine any part on your bag, clothes or shoe or luggage or any components will need to go through this process. And it is a highly polluted process, but the industry has been practicing this way for production for decades. And there are no new technology or new material or new investment looking into upgrading such a process. 
And this is only one step in manufacturing or producing product that we consume every day. And this is also a workshop uh, for leather cutting. And for the winter shoes often include more than 40 pieces of materials including together with around 150 steps in making. Such a process is facilitated by its production network as what I was showing for these two workshop. They are much more than that. And within the process of making a shoe, majority of the step is lower tech and labor intensive as we all understand. But the interest part is in recent years, in investment and interest is looking at new material development, technology adaptation and automations. And for my research is interested to look at this coexistence of different form of production. And it is generating a new network of production. Such a network is designed to be adaptive, creative, and fast. The concept of smart production rests in forms of flexible production, where the relationship are changing between human body and machine the collective and individual data reasoning and is social adaptation. And I'm currently working on all the materials I collected from the field work and try to work on my dissertation writings and thanks for ICI and everyone who supported the project. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Terrific, thank you so much. Uh... Lafu. Uh, our last speaker is Xia Li, who is a PhD, stu PhD student um, at the um, uh, School for Public Engagement. Um, yeah, th things change. I mentioned that a DT graduated since then, um, since she re uh, accepted the uh, fellowship. And, uh, Xia Li is one who um, successfully defended her dissertation just not too long ago. Um, and uh, uh, you know, congratulations to Shelly. Uh, also, we gave the floor to Xia to present her project. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Shelly. And um, yeah, like Grace just said, uh, I will just defend my dissertation. And I will graduate in May next year. And this project, this project uh, ex, uh, extend, extends my dissertation and it looks at um, the social integration of migrant workers in three cities in China, Beijing, Shenzhen, and Xiamen. And before I, before I get into the project itself, please let me uh, briefly give us some in background information about the China's hukou system. Hukou system um, classifies residents' hukou status by their birthplace. So it divides each one as either urban or rural hukou holders. Access to basic public services, such as housing, uh, health care, education, is only limited to those who have local hukou. So migrant workers are those who work in cities but not have obtained the local hukou. So there are two main reasons I choose the three cities, uh, like the migrant workers in these three cities. Uh, one thing is uh, Beijing and Shanghai, they adopt uh, a point-based hukou settlement policy uh, to grant urban citizenship to migrant workers. Basically, it is really assign certain points based on migrant workers' characteristics, such as their educational background, their uh, skills, their age. And only those who meet a very high thresholds can obtain local hukou. While Shenzhen, uh, well, Xiamen, on the other hand, take a relatively easy approach. It means like migrant workers just need to provide us uh, uh, some documents and that they can get a local hukou. And the second reason is uh, Beijing actually uh, had the lowest migrant population proportion among the four MAC cities in China, while Shenzhen had the highest. Xiamen, on the other hand, had the highest score on a social integration index of uh, migrant population based on 2017 uh, social integration report. So for these two reasons, I choose the three cities to kind of show the range of social integration uh, status of migrant workers in China. Uh, so my re main research really want to see how the social integration status of migrant workers vary across the three cities. 
uh, I proposed a mixed method to conduct the, per the project. For the quantitative part, uh, I took data from China Migrants Dynamic Survey, which is very popular uh, survey um, focused exclusively on migrant workers in Chinese cities. And uh, in the survey, migrant workers will be asked uh, like about their subjective feelings about these five uh, statements, such as like, uh, do you agree with the following statements? Uh, whether you love the city where you live, you pay attention to the city's changes, whether you want to be a, a member, and uh, like, oh, whether you feel local residents are willing to accept you as a member of local community. And for the qualitative part, uh, my initial plan was to go back to China, to go to visit the three cities and conduct in-person interviews. But because of the pandemic, I was not able to go back. So I have changed my plan. I will conduct interviews online. And this is uh, still an online process, um, ongoing process. So today I will just show us very, uh, some brief uh, results from the quantitative analysis uh, part. So here, uh, this figures, this slide shows the distribution of migrant workers' answers uh, to the statement like, whether you love the city where you, you are at. Uh, and here, the first two bars represent uh, migrant workers from Beijing, the middle two from Shenzhen, and last two from Xiamen. And uh, the first bar in each city represent whether it's the migrant workers with a hook, uh, urban hukou from another city or whether it's just uh, migrant workers with a rural hukou. And the yellow bar just represents they are strongly, they strongly agree with this statement, they love the city. And the green one means that just agree. Um, and um, so the blue strongly disagree and the orange disagree. And from here, we can see regardless 2011, 2017, um, there were large shares of migrant workers in Xiamen strongly agree that they love the city, followed by Beijing and the Shenzhen. And um, the next one is whether they pay attention to the city changes and actually the same patterns, uh, is, we can see the same patterns across the cities. The ones in Xiamen, uh, they, are, they are more likely to strongly like, uh, agree that they pay attention to the city's changes and followed by uh, the ones in Beijing. And then the last one is in, uh, in, Xiang, uh, in Shenzhen. And about whether they want to be a member of local community, as we can see migrant workers willing to become a local member, uh, actually in, in Beijing and Xiamen, they increased uh, from 2011 to 2017, while migrant workers in Shenzhen decreased, uh, especially for urban migrant workers. And about the last one, um, about the fourth statement, whether they feel like uh, local residents are willing to accept them as one member of local community. And we can see that Beijing had a large, um, we can see urban workers feel overall uh, urban migrant workers, they feel the more welcome than rural migrant workers across all three cities. And, uh, but uh, compared with the previous three statements, we can see the shares of strongly agreeing with this statement decreased sharply. And about the last one, oops, sorry, whether they feel local re residents always look down on non -lo locals. Uh, we can see that Beijing had a large share of agree or strongly agree with this statement than those in Shenzhen. And the last one is in Xiamen. And uh, it's very clearly that rural migrant workers always had a stronger feeling that they are not feeling being respectful than urban migrant workers. But what is interesting is the shares of agreeing that they feel locals always look down on them increased in Beijing and Shenzhen from 2011 to 2017. So here, just like a uh, very quick go through the by educational level means whether someone have at least a high school degree or not. And actually the same patterns apply to three cities. And uh, the difference actually, uh, it's not that big between those with a high school degree and above and those who do not. Um, but the overall is those who with a higher school degree are more likely uh, to feel more welcome and have a higher social integration status. Um, so overall, um, uh, I would conclude that migrant workers in Xiamen in general, they felt more welcome and had better social integration than those in Beijing with migrant workers in, in, in Shenzhen has uh, kind of the worst experiences. But by their hukou status, migrant workers with uh, urban hukou in other cities generally did better than those with a rural hukou. And by educational level, 
those with higher educational levels, they feel more welcomed and have more higher, uh, have better social integration status than those with a lower educational uh, uh, educational attainment. So that's it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jia. Um, I think given, uh, yeah, there are, Helen has a question. Well, I just wanted to say a quick word on, you know, um, Mandri Mahanjan is a co-director at India China Institute too. She's in the room, um, you know, um, obviously participating in this round of discussions. I think, you know, this is, is is not meant to be a very formal presentation. It is a formal presentation by the fellows. At the same time, it is a um, it's a meeting. It is a meet up meeting for all to be um, engaged to ask questions, especially those who probably um, are new to India China Institute and these programs. I see a few uh, faces over there, our students. Um, I think we'll just open up the floor to questions, uh, but at the same time, Manjuri, if you wanted to uh, probably wrap, you know, to summarize and, and also pose questions, um, that would be great. Thanks, Grace. I think given the time constraint, let's focus on if any of the um, other participants, not the presenters, but others have any questions about the fellowship and especially the impending round of the fellowship for this coming summer. That's a good idea. Helen, I thought I saw your hand up earlier on. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Grace, thank you so much. I was just mailing cheering up for yeah. the award winners, actually. But, you know, thank you so much for the chance. I guess I just have one quick question. Um, that is about uh, you know, the vetting procedure of our applications, like who will be on, you know, you know, who will be sitting on the committee to, to you know, like uh, vet um, the quality of our proposals. I guess, I hope this is not, you know, like too much a question to ask. It's just my, you know, curiosity. Um, yeah, uh, and if we get, um, I guess, the award or the funding, um, like how I guess because for me I'm, I'm very curious to explore um, to expand uh, you know the locales of my research and, and I definitely would like to go to India at some point. Um, I, I hope this question also wouldn't be taken in the wrong way. I just wanted to um, ask like how how will the first timers I guess um, safety uh, will be like that sort of guaranteed like safety will be guaranteed like if we, we travel to India. As well. But for me, I'm not a first timer, so still, I, I just would like to ask that question. Um, hope that's okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let's collect probably a, one more or two more questions from our audience. So um, I see that Manjun has two excellent questions in the chat. Manjun, do you want to say them aloud or should we just read them out? Uh, sure, I can quickly mention them. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, so I have two quick questions. Uh, the first is, could could you all elaborate on how you spend the grant money? Because some of your research is more theoretical. Uh, so besides the traveling part, like what areas did you feel like you needed money for? Um, and second one is a couple of you mentioned you conducted conducted interviews. Uh, I was wondering, did you need to go through the IRB process? If so, I know it's it's a long and can be hectic. Um, so I, I was wondering, what was your experience? And with that, I think um, if some of our fellows can pick it up and answer, that would be great. And let me quickly um, answer the first question that Helen said about what's the selection process. So you submit your application. There's a selection committee that's constituted by the two co-directors, Mark and I. Grace is on it. And we usually have a couple of members from the faculty advisory committee. So that includes two other faculty members of the new school. Um, and then we usually have a round of interviews um, to, to come up with the finalists. But um, Shia, I saw that you were just about to speak, maybe to answer one of Manjun's questions. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I can answer Manjun's like two questions. Uh, because I did not have a chance to go back to China, but the, the ICI funding still gonna help me a lot with the project because 
um, for my I think my money can spend in two parts. One is I hire a research assistant in China who help me collect some policies uh, from these three cities. Uh, another thing is in order for me to uh, recruit recruit uh, uh, interviewees to participate in this project, uh, kind of I uh, allocate a certain amount of money for each one, kind of as the uh, incentives. So, so that is how I spend the most of the uh, grant money. And the second question, yes, uh, especially uh, if you're gonna interview, um, what do we say, like some, the, the, the vulnerable uh, population of the society or like including uh, children, you definitely need to go through the IRB process and it takes very long. So I suggest you, if you, you are thinking about doing this interview, so you should start it as soon as possible. Grace, did you want to address the question about um, safety and logistics if students actually do travel to India or China? Yeah, well, in regard to the safety, um, I think this is a very particular year, right? So um, it is what we all have concerns as to whether international travel is safe or not. In the past, the same, uh, you know, when you travel internationally to a foreign country, I think some of the obvious things are, um, you know, we just need to attend to it. There is actually some uh, write-ups about traveling to foreign countries, things that we should be aware of. Um, uh, when you are entering into the country, um, you know, places where even within the United States, places where you travel, you, you, you know, uh, um, the areas you wanted to learn, uh, to, to have some ideas about that. I think, um, you know, uh, we will definitely talk about that once you are accepted. There are certain protocols that we wanted to follow, but in a time and year like this, uh, when COVID is still very present around us, um, we will uh, follow the, the uh, uh, rules regulations that is set out by the school, by the CDC. Um, we would uh, um, definitely, uh, you know, uh, be, we wanted you to be aware of that, of that, but we, at, you know, at the institute level, we would also wanted to, um, uh, to, what should I say, to um, uh, be even more uh, attentive to the uh, uh, security issues. Um, aside from that, logistically, the money uh, that we're assigning aside this year, we're talking about $2,500 or possibly $3,500 for our last cohort of uh, fellows, the, the fellows who are here, we awarded $3,500. That normally should um, cover, should be enough for uh, the air, the hotel, and uh, uh, also uh, the uh, regular you know, uh, travel expenses. At times, students also want to use the money to say, uh, subscribe um, books, to purchase certain equipments. Those are, those are all allowable uh, expenses. Logistically, we would have definitely wanted to advise, well, you plan your trip early on. We all know when purchasing tickets, for instance, earlier than later, it saves money. Make uh, arrangements early enough will definitely help to plan logistically. For this year, as to whether um, we are able to travel is yet a question. So for now, we're talking about online research. And I think for online research, if any of our fellows want to share your experience in doing just that, that might be helpful to this, co this uh, new body of students as well. Um, I would say perhaps Xia, you have done quite a bit of that. Would you like yeah. to say a few words? Sure. Um, so about me, because my project in includes two parts. One is like an online collection of policies and data. The other side is about the interview. So uh, I think 
one possible way of like um you may um, have some cost of online searching is uh, sometimes you may need to pay to to kind of get access to certain uh, data you need uh, but in my case the data i um i i am using to analyze it's kind of free down free from uh, for downloading um but i think it, in some cases you may need to um like uh, pay certain fees to to get access to certain um data set so that is one thing uh and uh, just also i mentioned earlier um because um i i kind of doing data like a policy collection that kind of requires a lot of time so i i have a help from a research assistant from china and also i may need that 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 person had me to do some interviews because the time changes so that also is some kind of cost uh, like we can utilize from this fund yeah thank you i think there is a question coming from uh, Malaku. Uh, is it confirmed that there will be no global travel that we do not know most of the students travel during the summertime so we have a few months, well, occasionally students do go um, outside of the country uh, during the uh, spring semester. Um, yeah, well, the travel for individual uh, students uh, travel to foreign countries, India and China in this case, uh, we do not have a clear um, idea as to whether that's possible or not. So for now, we're setting $2,500 for online research. And if it opens up the school, uh, I would say by perhaps February, when we should, we should be the time that we announce the fellowship, we would have a clearer idea. And just to um, take up her follow up question. Yes, I think you can apply with travel in your budget. Um, if after you have submitted the application, it becomes clear that travel is not allowed, we will give you an opportunity to revise your budget and reallocate your budget to other purposes. Yeah. So um, I don't see any other questions and we are over time that we had said the session would go on for. So let me maybe wrap up. And I think my main task is really to thank each and every one of our student fellowship recipients and presenters. Um, you know, five minutes absolutely does not do justice to the enormity of the work that you all have done. And um, I'm really humbled by the diversity of the projects, but also how each one of you managed to bring in insights of your discipline, your training and your schools to the particularities of the politics and history of the place that you were looking at or um, the people and thoughts you were looking at. Um, so there was a lot of very interesting and thoughtful work. Thank you very much for your creativity in managing during this exceptional COVID period. Um, but I also saw it not as, you know, a lot of work, but in some ways that also really pointed to new trajectories and new fields and kind of incomplete um, journeys that still need to be undertaken. So a huge congratulations and huge applause to each one of you. Um, and please put out the word um, that there will be another round of fellowships with the deadline in February 1 to your friends, to your colleagues, fellow students, um, and we look forward to new applications. But a huge applause to the current round of fellows. Absolutely, yeah. Um, th this is absolutely an exceptional year. Our, our fellows, I think yours is really not a year, but two years uh, endeavor of work and uh, dedication to. And I'm glad that we have this opportunity to share your work, to share, you know, to celebrate uh, you know, your fellowship with India China Institute. Thank you so much for that. And for those um, who are new to India China Institute, who are pondering to apply for the fellowship, indeed visit our website. There is a lot of information over there. There are student field notes and that could be an information note to you as well. So with that, we thank you everyone for your participation. <laughs>